Okay, folks, we're just giving everyone a few seconds to get logged in here before we get started. Um, if you are already logged in with us here tonight, you can find some information in the chat about how to purchase the featured book for tonight's event. So check that out while we wait. All right, good evening and welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Chelsea from Greenlight, and we're thrilled to host tonight's event with Edward Schwartzchild presenting his new book, Insecurity. He'll be talking with Gilbert King, so you're in for an excellent time. Before we start, I just want to say a huge thanks to Edward, Gilbert, and the team at SUNY Press for making this happen, and to all of you for showing up. Though we're not able to host events in our store spaces, our community of authors and readers is still here. We're grateful for your support and for the chance to make this space for conversation and connection. Now I have just a couple of housekeeping things to go over. Uh, in our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they cannot see or hear you. Uh, your video and audio will not be enabled. They can see that you're here though, and you can see a count of your fellow attendees at the top of your Zoom screen. The exact location of that count depends on what kind of device you're using. Uh, you'll see a couple of icons at the bottom of your Zoom window that we'll be using throughout the event if you'd like to interact with the authors. Uh, one is the chat icon with one speech bubble. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat throughout the event. That's a great way to show your appreciation for the author and to interact with your fellow attendees. Uh, you, if you have a specific question you'd like to have answered by the author, please post that question in the Q&A module. You can find it by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. Uh, we'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program. We are recording tonight's event, so look for video or audio versions on our social channels later on. And importantly, tonight's featured book, Insecurity, is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. We're excited to be able to offer actual shopping in our bookstore locations, 12 p.m. to 6 p.m. Tuesday through Sunday. And you can purchase Edward's book and many others on site or order online at greenlightbookstore.com for a quick pickup at the store or for shipping anywhere in the U.S. If you care about supporting the careers of authors and the ongoing existence of independent bookstores, buying tonight's featured book is a great way to show your support. Now for tonight's featured authors. Um, our interviewer for tonight is Gilbert King. He is the author of Beneath a Ruthless Sun. His previous book, Devil in the Grove, was awarded the 2013 Pulitzer Prize for general nonfiction. The book was also runner up for the Dayton Literary Peace Prize for nonfiction and a finalist for both the Chautauqua Prize and the Edgar, uh, Edgar Award for Best Fact Crime. My cat is causing chaos in the background, if you hear <laughs> any background noise. Uh, King has written about race and criminal justice for the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Atlantic. He's also a contributor to the Marshall Project and the author of The Execution of Willie Francis, published in 2008. King is currently a fellow at the New York Public Library's Dorothy and Lewis B. Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers. He'll be speaking with our featured author, Edward Schwartzchild, a former Stegner Fellow, Fulbright Scholar, and NYFA Fellow in Fiction. He is the author of Responsible Men and The Family Diamond. His work has appeared in The Guardian, The Believer, Tin House, Virginia Quarterly Review, and the Yale Journal of Criticism, among other publications. At the University at Albany, State University of New York, he is Associate Professor of English, Director of Creative Writing, 
fellow of the New York State Writers Institute. His new book, Insecurity, peels back the curtain on the Transportation Security Administration to reveal the human drama hidden behind airport checkpoints. Part airport thriller, part family drama, part love story, Insecurity explores how those who strive to protect us are often unable to protect themselves. Edward is going to start us off with a reading from the book, and then he'll be talking with Gilbert and with all of you. Edward, please take it away. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Chelsea. It, it's, uh, it's a great honor to be here, and I'm so, I'm so grateful to you and to everyone at Greenlight, especially uh, Rebecca Fitting for, for making this happen and making Greenlight happen. It, it's great to be able to be at a independent bookstore during a time like this, even virtually. Uh, thank you so much for making it happen. And, and thanks to Gil for being here and, and agreeing to do this amid everything else. And, and thank you to all of you for showing up. Um, it's just great to see all the participants here and, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really thrilled to have this book party with, with everybody. So, so th thanks so much. Uh, I'm going to read from somewhere close to the beginning of Insecurity, and it's uh, the main character. His name is Gary Waldman. He's a transportation security officer, and this scene winds up changing his life and, and sort of changes the whole trajectory of what's going to happen for him in the future, and it, it's sort of the inciting incident for the book in many ways. Uh, I think all you need to know is that uh, Corelli is his supervisor. His wife, who, all, who died almost a year ago, is named Lori, and they have a six-year-old son named Ben. Uh, and this scene takes place in one of those great airport locations, uh, the, uh, one of the bathrooms, the, the men's room in Albany International Airport. <clears throat> I'll read for about five, six, seven minutes, something like that. When I opened the stall door and saw a guy rushing toward me, I panicked. Then I realized I was face to face with a flustered, terrified traveler who was desperate for help. An old man collapsed over here, the guy said, pointing. I was standing by the sink. I don't think he's breathing. I considered running to get Corelli. That would be standard operating procedure. But maybe this was something minor and why create unnecessary commotion? Create calm, right? One look at the man on the floor though and I sensed a real emergency. Two college aged guys were trying mouth to mouth on the lifeless, splayed out body. A once white V-neck t-shirt partially covered his silver haired chest. There was a bright blue button down shirt balled up next to him. Pungent aftershave, sulfuric like a polluted stream. I watched as one of the college guys did the compressions counting them off while the other guy clamped the old man's nose and breathed into his mouth. The guy doing the compressions needed to lock his elbows and move his hands lower. I radioed Corelli and told him to send the EMTs over. As I spoke, I realized I was the one person in the room who knew exactly where the closest AED was. I quickly adjusted the college guy's arms, command presence. Get that t-shirt off while I'm gone, I said. You're doing great here, don't panic, I'll be right back. I hustled out of the bathroom, thinking the old man was about to die. He was so pale and pasty. Those college kids would be the last ones to see the guy alive. I grabbed the AED off the wall. The traveler who'd surprised me trailed behind, repeating what he'd seen, maybe to get the images out of his head or maybe to explain how it wasn't his fault. He was standing by the sink. He reached down for the water, then his hands clawed at his chest. He didn't say a thing. Looked like he decided to sit down and then he just plopped over backwards. Don't worry, I said shocked at how relaxed my voice sounded, as if I spent every day rushing through the concourse with a defibrillator. You did the right thing. Let's talk. More hustle now, and we might do some good. I stepped through the crowd of people, knelt down, opened up the AED, and it started squawking out instructions as soon as I switched it on, just like in the first aid course I'd taken before Ben's birth. All I had to do was follow the directions, get everyone to stand back, place the pads correctly. Then the man vomited, and that changed the situation. The college guys, so brave at first, couldn't handle it, and they backed away. I was disgusted too, but I didn't flinch. Credit fatherhood, I guess. I looked at the chunky, peach-colored mess and wondered what the man had been eating. 
The image of a smorgasbord, like the ones I used to love in college, flashed by. The steam rising from the buffet, the sterno fumes. Ponderosa, baby, I'd say to my willing friends, and off we'd go, ready to graze those tables. Without more thought than that, I took over completely. I wasn't going to wait for the EMTs. I cleaned the area as best I could and kept the mouth to mouth going. I felt so calm. Was something wrong with me? What diseases can you catch from someone's puke? Then it got spooky for a moment when I felt the weight of the man's head. Nothing more or less than a heavy round object, awkward to lift, and the extremely oily hair didn't help. There was the pull of Lori, what it was like near the very end. I'd never felt so powerless and there was no one in sight and I couldn't move her and I had to move her. I was breathing for this stranger and I felt as if I were inhaling death and I'd had enough death, thank you very much. But I shook that off, backed away again and listened as the machine did its work. Do not touch the patient, analyzing heart rhythm, preparing shock, move away from the patient, shock delivered. I focused on the body in front of me, observing it as carefully as I could for signs of life. Lately, Ben and I had been scouring Washington Park for signs of spring. Crocuses, robins, hyperactive squirrels, a hint of green in the tree branches above our heads. I worried again about the dictates of SOP. Should I really have waited? The first order of business must be to help everyone survive. Shouldn't you save someone if you can? Then, in an astonishingly short amount of time, it felt like seconds, the old man stirred. The room smelled of barf and barbecue now. The man sat up, nearly bashing his head into the long row of sinks. His skin flushed, his lips reddened, and he seemed to start talking before he was breathing. I tried to take it all in, but my wandering mind seesawed back to Ben's birth back to when he wasn't even Ben yet, just a waxy, motionless, tiny body the midwife was lifting out of the bathtub's reddening water and settling onto Lori's chest. I kept trying to be the best labor partner ever, leaning forward, waiting in my boxes and t-shirt right behind Lori in the tub, hands on her shoulders. The baby didn't breathe and didn't open his eyes, and the candles I'd balanced on the shelf above the sink guttered off black smoke as if they were about to be snuffed out too. I kept staring at the bruised blue baby's blank, unmoving, shut-eyed face, and I heard only the sound of murky water sloshing in the tub, and I felt overwhelmed by the fear that I was the father of a stillborn baby, soon, no doubt, to be divorced, because how could we recover from this? Fatherless myself for most of my life, I would now never become a father. I'd die alone, remembered by no one, which must have been my destiny all along. But then, the midwife interrupted my pity party. We're good here, she said. And the boy we'd named Benjamin opened his tiny mouth and gasped and wailed away, his cries and answer to the cries Lori had pushed out for hours. His skin pinked up and minutes started speeding by again. And in a daze, I was cutting the umbilical cord. It felt like slicing into a thick piece of sashimi, octopus. And before I could get my mind around what I'd just done, what Lori had just done, I was standing in front of those bathroom sink candles, still burning, holding the towel wrapped baby to my chest while the woman I loved more than anything in the world showered herself off and then stood beside me, leaning in close, warm, so completely alive. At that moment, I felt a sparkling in my lungs I'd never felt before, like a torch igniting inside me, burning brighter until the heat could barely be contained within my body. I closed my eyes and the torch flared higher and it was almost blinding. Was this what people meant when they talked about a third eye opening? Transcendence? I had no clue, but I could not stop grinning. And that's when the airport EMTs rushed in. Two rail thin guys, both tall and twitchy with caffeine or something stronger to help them through the long hours. They probably had plenty of options in the enormous bags slung over their shoulders, but they looked devoted to their work and they immediately took charge. They kept the man seated and checked his signs. He's stable, said the one with the mullet. Nice work, way to save a life. And I'll stop there. Oh, that was great, Ed. Thank you so much for reading that. Um, you know, it's, it was just occurring to me what a great reader you are. I just was hearing your voice and I'm like, wow, I wanna go back into this book again because there are things I caught in your reading of it that really just jumped out at me. 
But Thanks. one of the things I really wanted to ask you about is, um, you know, I, I think it was really masterful the way you're just, this is a, this is a book that's really uh, about, you know, a father and a son dealing with loss, grieving, and yet it's a literary thriller. So you've got these moments of, of action and high tension, and but then these other beautifully drawn moments, be, you know, relationships with your character, and especially with your son, uh, as you work through this past year of, of, of or as Gary works through his, this past year of his life. So I really want to just start by asking you, you know, I'd love to talk to you about all the research that you did for this and, and when the kernels of this novel came to you, when, when, when did you first realize that, you know, this is something I wanted to explore and I wanted to involve the TSA? <laughs> oh, thanks, guy. And I can't thank you enough for being here. It's so great to see you, you know? I That's wish we could be like sitting in the same place, but it's, it's great to see you, man. Uh, and, and that question, uh, I mean, I think for me, father-son material, it, so far, it, it's a part of everything I write almost. So that, that part we can talk more about. Uh, the TSA, I would say it started kind of the day after 9-11 on some level. Uh, on on 9-12, I was already fascinated and concerned about the explosion of security apparatus uh, all around the country, whether it was you know buildings getting barricaded. I live in Albany, New York, so that's the state capitol was suddenly barricaded. Uh, you went to the airport, everything was different. Uh, you listened to NPR, everything was different. So I was immediately fascinated, but I, I didn't know how to, to write about it. Uh, but over the years, I, I kept thinking about it, and uh, eventually I had a, a character who worked for the TSA, and I wanted to write about him, and he kept he kept uh, taking taking more and more of the project I was working on, so I needed to learn about him, and and I, I wasn't sure how to do that. I wasn't how to sure how to do the research. Like I mean, you're a nonfiction writer; you have a very clear way to do research. I went to the airport uh, and sort of looked at checkpoints for a while. Sometimes I'd sit there and have a cup of coffee. Uh, then whenever I traveled, I would linger in the in the checkpoint. I would I would I would choose to have the pat down. And, and try to have conversations with the TSA people, but they, they, weren't, they weren't really that forthcoming, you know? Uh, I, I called around to people and, and asked, hey, do you know anybody who works for the TSA? And I got a few names that way, but the people I contacted, you know, maybe it was my approach, uh, but they didn't really want to talk to me either. So eventually I, uh, I had another idea. I had, I had read a book that I really loved called uh, New Jack by the nonfiction writer Ted Conover, who does really immersive uh, journalism or immersive nonfiction projects. And he had wanted to write about correction officers and their training here in, in Albany. There's a, an academy. And he, at some point, he had permission and then permission was withdrawn. And instead of giving up, he decided to uh, apply to become a corrections officer. And he, he, he went through the training. He uh, he, he then went and worked for a year at Sing Sing as a correction officer, and he wrote this phenomenal book uh, called New Jack. I can't remember the one, the Pulitzer or the National Book Award, but, but one of those. And it's, it's an incredible read. Uh, so I started thinking, well, you know, maybe I could apply for a job with the TSA and do some, do some immersive research of my own. And, and, and then you know, I, can, I can tell you what happened with that, too. I, I, I started looking at the US.gov listing, thinking, Maybe I could get a job in Philly, uh, where I'm from, and work there for a summer. Uh, but after checking for a while, I saw a job right here in Albany at Albany International. And it was a uh, part-time, all the jobs are part-time these days, uh, working the morning shift, uh, five to nine. And I thought, you know, I could, I could do that. I don't usually teach between the hours of five and nine. Uh, so I applied for the job and then went through the whole long process and, and got the job. Uh, I just, I'm trying to picture you like hanging out at airports, watching pat downs and things. And, and did you get any strange looks or uh, visits? Uh, I, I, did, I did get, I did get strange looks. I, nobody, nobody came knocking on my door, thankfully, though I did, I did begin even then to develop a certain paranoia about being a writer in this security environment and, and wondering uh, how my intentions might be perceived. And that, that paranoia stayed with me uh, through my, through my time on the job for sure. Can you talk a little bit about what that training was like and what you went through? You know, obviously you're doing research, but you're also working as a, at a job. So what, what was that like? Well, how did it start once you were, you know, 
accepted and hired. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was interested in working a job because I had this character, but I was also really interested in, in working a job in that sort of post 9-11 way of thinking about who are these people who have this job? Uh, what is it like to work the job? And do they have kids? Do they have spouses? You know, how, how, how similar are they to me? And, and uh, what are their hopes and dreams? And, and questions like that in order, to, in order to understand my character, but also this deeper understanding of what is going on with the security industry in our world. Uh, so I took the job and the first two weeks were uh, training in a classroom in the basement of Albany International. You know, parts of the airport, you know, you don't get to see otherwise. Uh, just in a dark classroom with a lot, watching a lot of videos, a lot of training, a lot of sort of tests. Uh, and then after two weeks, uh, I went up on the floor to do on the job training with, with someone always watching me, but learning all the tasks that, that everybody sees when they, when they travel, when, when we used to travel. Uh, whether you're the, the document checker or working the scanner or doing bag check, uh, standing at the exit, you rotate through all those jobs and, and, and someone makes sure you're doing it right until you can do them by yourself. Wow. And I know you've given a lot of thought about it, like this form of research, you know, not to be perceived as a writer taking this job to write a book. That wasn't what you were doing. Right. Um, but can you talk a little bit about that? About? You know, like some of the, some of the ethics and the things that you worried about, like taking this job, was it just, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I felt, I, I, it was really a complicated thing for me to, to sort of think through. Uh, I felt paranoid. Uh, that I was going to be uncovered, even though throughout the process, I never lied. Uh, I always, I, I used my name. I, I, I said I was a writer and professor. You know, they, they knew what they were, they knew who they were hiring. Uh, no one really asked me about that, but I, I thought about it and worried about it a lot. Uh, and I, I understood that even though I was trying to learn what these, what these other workers were going through, I didn't have the same stress uh, that they would have. Uh, if I failed a test and got flushed out of the TSA, I, I you know, I, I could still keep my job. I could keep writing. I could keep teaching. Uh, but for the other people, the, it, it really, if they failed a test, it had real, real serious repercussions. If they, if they couldn't get the shift they wanted, it had repercussions. And I, I worried about, you know, I was, I was doing the training. I was, I was using government resources uh, to do this job, and. I felt some complicated feelings about that too, but I, I thought that A, I, I took the job very seriously myself and I think I, I did good work while I was there. I didn't, I didn't stop any planes from going down, but I, I did the job and I, I, I worked the job well. A lot of people didn't last uh, as long as I lasted. I mean, there's high turnover in those jobs and I held it for a couple months. Uh, and I also thought that, that my desire to kind of humanize the, the workers was, was worth something, that, that if some taxpayer dollars went towards me, uh, there was a, a decent return on the investment. That's, that's, what I, that's what I hope. Right, and, and, and to be clear, I think this is more of a valentine to the profession in a lot of ways. It doesn't, you didn't really go in there and drag into the security issues and, 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 and expose anything. It's really more of a loving portrait of, of people who are trying to work and, do their job. I think that was one, one thing that's very clear. Um, yeah, I mean, I, there I, must, oh, go ahead. I mean, I, I would have done that. I mean, I, it was just my experience, you know, I, I would, I was totally prepared to write a scathing uh, look at the Albany International Airport. If, if I had seen terrible things happening, if I had seen people stealing stuff or, you know, uh, having sex in the bathrooms or, or anything like that, it would have, it would have worked its way into the novel. But what I saw was hardworking people. Uh, trying to find their way into a career that had benefits, that had the possibility for advancement, uh, and, and had some like real job security, you know, no pun intended. Uh, so that's what I saw. And that's, that's why it became, I, I love your word, it became kind of a, a, a valentine in a way towards, this, towards these workers in this place. No, yeah, I just think it's, 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 you're clearly a writer who cares about characters and cares about getting it right and not being, hitting false notes. And that's just so apparent for me. But the, I was thinking there must have been moments where like, maybe, you know, you live in Albany, you must like get recognized at the airport, right? <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, those, those incidents were, were unpredictable to me. And, and uh, you know, I mentioned my paranoia. Uh, 
the very first day I was working on the floor, I came out, I came out of the cave of the basement where they'd kept us for the classes. I was working on the floor, totally nervous. Uh, must have been like 5 30, 6 o'clock in the morning. One of the one of the first people who came through when I was working the scanner was this uh, emeritus professor at UAlbany where I teach and a, gr a gracious Southern guy, a, a, a great writer, a sort of a, uh, he writes these, these sort of metafictional meta histories, you know, beautiful prose writer. And he comes walking through the scanner and he looks at me and he just points at me and goes, this guy's an imposter. And at that moment with my paranoia already pretty high, <laughs> I, was, I was terrified. I expected I was gonna be fired in a moment. Uh, I had this guy watching over me, you know, making sure I was doing the job right. And he, he didn't bat an eye. He just, he just sort of said to me, is that your grandfather? I said, no, he's a, he's a great guy. Uh, and I said to my friend, I said, Gene, I'll talk to you later. Uh, and he went on, but his wife was with him and she was in a wheelchair and she had been uh, taken through another path through the checkpoint, through the, 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 you know, the walk through metal detector instead of through the scanner. And they reunited, not that far from where I was. And I could hear her. She asked, uh, what's Ed doing here? And Gene, like, like he was given a lecture or something, like in a big room, he just said, he's working on a novel. Uh, and again, I thought, oh man, I'm in, I'm in deep, deep trouble. Uh, oh God, but, that's too funny. But again, it just didn't, it, it wasn't a threat. Nobody saw that as a threat in that environment. Right. You know, one of the things that's really the way you work through the, you know, there are this thriller, obviously, but there's these moments of tenderness and grief. And, and I was just wondering, you know, you're, you, Gary's character is dealing with the loss of his wife, Lori. And I'm just wondering how grief played out into your exploration in this novel. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. I mean, the novel took a, a, a crazy long time, you know, to, to work on and, and for me to, to find it. I always tell my students to, to, to uh, discover their work, to, to discover what they're writing about by writing, that through writing will discover. Uh, it took me a long time to discover uh, this book. And in the course of writing the book, uh, you know, the, in the course of writing the book, my, my brother passed away uh, from sort of a sudden heart attack, you know, at 15 year, 50 years old, way too young for that to happen. And he just, you know, he, he didn't see it coming, we didn't see it coming. And it was, it, it just happened. And I had a lot of a lot of grief to sort of process and to think about uh, how I process grief, how my family processes grief, uh, to think long and hard about it. And and I think that's when the book began to really find its final shape. When uh, I, I I'm certain, uh, I, fortunately I don't know from experience. Uh, I'm certain that losing a spouse is different from losing a brother in all kinds of ways, but that that sort of working through the loss of my brother, Arthur, uh, just gave, gave the book its kind of center, its heart, I think. Yeah, I would, I would definitely agree with that. It's really, it's really beautifully moving. And, and uh, you know, one of the other things I wanted to ask you about is, um, you know, a writer that you and I both um, admire greatly, William Kennedy's from Albany. And here you are in the same city, you know William Kennedy, but you're writing about a very different Albany. And I'm just wondering, just given your background, you've written books that are based, most of your work has been based in Philadelphia. What was it like writing about Albany and this place that William Kennedy has sort of made his home? Right. Yeah. I mean, William Kennedy, he's, he's a, he's a living legend. He's, you know, he's an inspiration. You know, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to work with him at the university and he is, he is just someone you always want to be around and always want to talk to. And his, his work, you can't, you can't say enough about it. You know, he is, he is what people say. He is the Shakespeare of Albany. He is the uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez of Albany. There's, he's the Joyce of Albany. Uh, so, so deciding to write about Albany is kind of, you know, it, it wasn't what I intended to do. I, I, as you said, I was, I, I saw myself as a Philadelphia writer, but, uh, you know, I've been living here for 20 years. I never expected to live in Albany, but it's where I wound up. And, and I've learned, uh, I love so many things about Albany. So once, once I decided to make Albany kind of a character in the book or to, to, to set the book in Albany, it was a, a real pleasure to do, to sort, of, to sort of begin to see the city in a different way and think about how I might include it in the book. Uh, it's, no, it's no William Kennedy, uh, but 
you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it, it has a real debt to Albany and, and, I, and it has some real affection for Albany in it. Yeah, that's very obvious in the story and in, in, in the book. And, and I think, you know, one of the funny things, I, I grew up in Schenectady, which is not too far from Albany. It's part right. of the Capital District, Tri-City area. Um, but you mentioned in your book a couple of times you referenced Albany as Smallbany. And I remember doing that as a lot as a kid growing <laughs> up. And I don't know why that is. It's not that small, but. Yeah, I remember you talking about, you were talking the other day about how when you were growing up, they used to call it uh, when they were when they expanded the airport they used to call it albany intergalactic airport <laughs> yeah love... that was the big joke when when they were building that like international airport what do they have one flight to montreal like why is that international but i think it was my dad that called it albany intergalactic airport. <laughs> why not right um you know another thing that really plays a big role in, in the in this book is is tennis and i actually didn't know that much about your tennis background but but can you explain why tennis plays a big part in this book? Yeah, uh, I mean, a couple of reasons, right? Uh, one is that tennis is definitely the first sport I, I, I fell in love with as, as a kid. Uh, you know, the, the tennis of Bjorn Borg and John McEnroe, Roscoe Tanner, I'm dating myself, you know, Harold Solomon, he, like, he makes a random appearance in the book or maybe not so random, but I, I fell in love with tennis. The first sport I really wanted to play, uh, I never really developed a, a strong backhand, but it's it's a sport I love, and I, I still I love going to the U.S. Open. I, I love playing, and I have a great group of people uh, that I play with here in Albany at, at a sort of one of those one of those Albany treasures that you're talking about when you talk about Smallbody. These little this this great public club with eight clay courts, and you can play there. And I've spent a lot of time there over over these last few years. So that worked its way in, and I remember. When I was when I was in my early twenties, I, I lived in Japan for a year, doing the, you know, teaching English as a second language, and uh, at the high school where I worked, I wound up spending a lot of time with in the phys ed department, you know, just hanging out with those guys, and and I thought that would be, you know, it wasn't what I thought would be my life, but I thought you know, if you had to have another job, maybe being a phys ed teacher or a coach uh, would be would be great. Uh, so I always had that idea in my mind. So somehow Gary became a, a tennis a tennis coach uh, who who found his way into the TSA. And one other element about the tennis was that this sort of shows the the length of time this novel took. I mean, years back in maybe 2010 or so, I wrote a short story that that never really found its it just never really found its form. But within there, there was this, there was a scene, a father son scene on a tennis court. That I that I liked and I couldn't let go of, and that also that found its way into the novel and and grew into Gary's character too. Yeah, that's great. I am um, I'm going to ask uh, the audience to um, use the Q and A portal at the very bottom of the screen if you want to ask some questions. I'll moderate them. I can see them if they pop up. Um, I'm going to ask some more questions and I'll start going to the audience questions, but. Um, yeah, another thing is like the, the book has an epigraph. Um, it's easy to see the ball, but not so easy to notice the exact pattern made by its seams as it spins. And that's, that's from W. Timothy Galway's um, The Inner Game of Tennis. That, yeah. Is that a, an influence on you? Or Thank you for asking. I happen to have a, there it is, <laughs> The Inner Game of Tennis. Uh, yeah, you know, this was, you talk about the books you read when you're, when you're writing and, and how some of them, some of them just find their way into the book. And this, 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 the, it was actually a guy, at the, the, the pro at Albany Tennis Club, who I started hanging around with and I got a few lessons with. He was a great, great teacher. Still couldn't help my backhand, but he's a, he's a great guy, uh, Larry, and uh, Larry Yakubowski. And we were talking about what, what books I could consult to learn more about improving my game. And he mentioned this, uh, the inner game of uh, tennis. And, I just sank into it. It was it was perfect. You know, it's a book from the '70s. It's it's kind of it's kind of est inflected self help book about tennis, kind of Zen Buddhist, uh, New Age, and it just I just started that just breathed some more life into the book too. And and I it's I think it's since then it's given rise to a whole. I think you can get the inner game of golf, bowling, or squash. I think it's a whole industry now. But the inner game of tennis was the first one, I believe. And it's it's a beautiful book, uh, and and I, I definitely borrowed some of what was happening in that book to to sort of give Gary his mindset as a tennis coach. 
Well, I, again, I get back to the, the characters in this, in the story are just so richly drawn. And, and uh, there's some characters I can definitely understand the things that you want to write about, especially when you're talking about grief and, 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 and being a father of a son who's a little bit older than Ben in this book. But um, Diane comes into the story very early on in, in, that, in that very scene that you described, that you read earlier. I can't help thinking she must have been so much fun to write. I and mean, can you just talk about how you came about Diane's character and, and, and why you felt you know, drawn to, 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 to write about her? Yeah, uh, yeah. So many these these characters. I mean, it 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 took the book took a long time, but fortunately, these characters were a lot of fun to hang out with, uh, and all of them. I mean, Nefer is this great guy in the in the airport that I, I love to hang out with, and uh, and Diane was was really fun to get to know too. She uh, she she changed during the course of the book, you know, in in many ways. But uh, um, I'm trying to think some of the. Some of the ways that she developed were around her working in an animal hospital, which is something I had done as a thinking I was going to be a veterinarian in, in high school. And, and one of her big scenes happens in an animal hospital. And, and she just kept different things, kept growing around her. Uh, in and she's growing way, on Gary, too, a lot. You can <laughs> sort of see that as we go. It's just, you know, it's this new refreshing moment yes. in this life. Um, yeah. Yeah, like he he he's in a he's in a difficult place, and she appears to have a lot of answers and and help for him. Though it, you know it's it's always it's always complicated, right? And we're not going to get the book. We're not going to get into spoiling anything. You just have no. to keep reading this for yourself. I, <laughs> I read this thing in really literally one sitting. I went buzzing through, and I was like, when well, I got to you know, so there's some unbelievable, you know, it is a literary thriller too. It's not just the story of a father grieving with his son. So there's that, I wanna make sure that's clear. Um, we're starting to get some questions, but I have, I have one more question I just wanna ask and we'll segue into some of the questions from the audience. But, Great. you know, you're the director of creative, creative writing at Albany State. Can you talk about teaching and, and what a writer can learn from his students? Yeah, well, I love that you still, that you call it Albany State. That, that's another sign that you grew up uh, oh, here. Oh man. <laughs> is it Albany U? Oh, no, it's, it, even while I've been here, it's changed. They're now they, it's the University at Albany State University of New York, uh, or U Albany, I guess is what we say. Okay, yeah, I should have known better, but no, I like the sound of Albany State. I think that <laughs> I was like a sweatshirt that said Albany State. That'd be awesome. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, you know, even even before the pandemic and everything we're going through, I, I felt highly you know, grateful for the job I have. You know, I feel so fortunate that I get to spend my time talking uh, with, with students about reading and writing, you know, on, the, on a daily basis. Uh, I get to work at an institution where they have the New York State Writers Institute and we're, we're always bringing through great writers uh, into Albany. Uh, and and to, be, to be able to share work with students and, and watch them read things for the first time that maybe I've read a couple of times, but just see their, their minds kind of get blown by, by the work we get to read. It's, it's, such a, it's, it's more than just a pleasure, it's, it's an inspiration and it brings the work back to life for me. And, and uh, they help me see things in the work I had never seen before. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a great profession to, to have, especially as a writer. Uh, reading student work is, can be difficult and challenging, and but it's also really fun to try to help them make the next step uh, in their own work, and and to to go over those elements of craft that, that sometimes I need a reminder about too. Uh, in, in explaining things to them, uh, I help explain things to myself. So I, I feel it's a I don't, I don't know what the math is, you know, who's helping who more in the teaching relationship, but it's it's a real gift to be able to spend my time this way. Oh, that's really sweet, Ed. Um, one, one of the questions is, is somewhat related. This is from Julie Weed. How did your time in college influence your writing career? <laughs> Hi, Julie. Uh, Julie Bick is, is, the, is the Julie I knew in college, but she's Julie Weed. Is, uh, thank you so much for that question. Now, the time in college, I mean, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, it was in college that I really wanted to be, I learned that I wanted to become a writer. We were, we were at Cornell for undergrad and uh, I started taking my first creative writing workshops there, and I had a, I had a, some some friends who were in those workshops, and I, and great great teachers. 
uh, who, who were just, who helped coach uh, young writers. Uh, my favorite teacher was a guy named Dan McCall, uh, but there were, and James McConkey was there. And the, the other thing that I, that I realize now is that so many people pass through Cornell. You know, I realize I can, I can talk to people about uh, how, when Eudora Welty came to James McConkey's workshop and 13 of us got to sit there with Eudora Welty. Uh, I got to take a class, like a whole semester of a class with uh, Carlos Fuentes. Uh, Borges came to Cornell. Uh, I mean, it's just that Tobias Wolf came to Cornell and I, and I read his work for the first time there. Grace Paley uh, came to Cornell and I got to see her and she gave me a hug. Uh, so those kind of experiences at Cornell just made me want even more uh, to be a writer and be a part of that world. Can't, I, I can't underestimate what those years were like. Oh, that's great. Um, I have a question from Robinson Wageman or Wegman. Um, aside from the TSA research, how was the writing process of this novel similar or different to that of writing Responsible Men? Uh, hey, Robinson. Uh, it, it's Wegman. Uh, <laughs> great, great to get that question. Uh, the research, the, I mean, the, the, the research I described working for the airport, that was super different. Uh, the other research that was different was consciously at some point realizing that I had a, a guy working for the TSA. Uh, most of the book takes place in and around an airport. Uh, there's some kind of security threat so that I, I had to learn how to write a thriller. You know, it wasn't, I, I, I'd written father-son books before, I've, I've written about family, but I'd never really written something like a thriller. And to figure out that pacing, to figure out that structure, uh, it, it was fun to read a lot of thrillers, uh, but that, that was some of the research I had to do just to, just to figure out this, this slightly different genre uh, from what I'd been working on before. Well, let's have something of a follow-up from Greg Martin. And he asked, so much of the emotional stakes of the novel takes place in the past, but the main story moves relentlessly forward towards its climax in only a matter of days and weeks from the opening scene that you read. How did you, th um, how did you think of and conceive managing time in the book, moving back and forth, making sure the reader keeps moving forward, but giving the reader all they need to know about Gary's past? Uh, that's, a, that's a really, that's a kind question from Greg. Uh, it took a long time to figure that out. I mean, th this book, uh, I, I was telling Gil that, you know, I, I probably started working on this book sometime around 2010. I took the job at the airport in 2012. Uh, it's 2020 now. So I, I think I tried just about every way possible to structure the book. Uh, third person, multiple points of view, uh, very, just a number of paths, a number of ways to try to tell the story and to weave in the past. Uh, eventually I set on the first person point of view and that, that seemed just to, to work for Gary. And I realized it was his book all the way through, but, but how, could I, how could I have the thriller spine and move things relentlessly forward, but also give you a sense of, of Gary and his past. And eventually what I wound up doing that, that, I, that I liked uh, was most of the stuff that happens in the past is in the present tense. Uh, and that kind of, that kind of, when I started doing that, uh, that helped to give the, the, the worry about the parts in the past would be that they would be slow, they would bog the narrative down, and that the, the thriller element would get lost. But I felt that if I could write the parts in the past in the present tense, then they would have a kind of propulsive movement of their own. And that, that's how I settled on it. I, I hope it works. Well, you're just getting some great questions here. I'm just going to keep going with these. They're really good. Um, this is from Jesse Poole. It's so interesting you talk about paranoia flavoring your experience within TSA as the version of TSA post 9-11 feels so occasioned by paranoia. How did you mediate your paranoia as an infiltrator versus the backdrop of paranoia that seems characteristic of the organization? Uh, uh, Jesse, that's an awesome question. Uh, I've, been, I've been spending a bunch of the last few weeks reading some of Jesse's stories. They're, they're incredible. Uh, uh, and that's, that's a great question. I don't know that I was able to sort of separate it out. My, my memories of my time with the TSA were so inflected by paranoia and so concerned. I mean, I worked at the, the, the months I was at the TSA was uh, uh, Hurricane Sandy, uh, Halloween, uh, Thanksgiving, Obama's reelection, 
Uh, so these things were unfolding in real time while I was working for uh, the TSA. And I, I never felt uh, that I was, you know, I never, the paranoia never left. And in fact, the reason I eventually left, stopped working, I couldn't do the Ted Conover and work for a whole year. I just, I just couldn't. I, I, was, I was exhausted. It, it just wasn't going to work out. But I wanted to do a little bit longer. Uh, but one day I was reading the Albany Times Union and I saw an article uh, about some leafleting that had been happening at the airport. And it was written by, my, by a friend of mine, Casey Seiler, who's now the editor of the Albany Times Union. And I thought, you know, I don't want to become the story. I want, I want to do the research and then get out and, and write the story. I don't want suddenly there to be a newspaper article about how Professor Schwarzschild is working as a TSA agent. Uh, so, so I left in kind of a paranoid way. Um, but I think why the paranoia doesn't seep into the book the same way has to do with getting to know the people who work at the airport. And if, if I was able to mediate it at all, it was just by the being grounded in the experience of talking to my coworkers and learning about their lives and their families and their struggles. Uh, that's, that's I, I guess that's the way I, I sort of stepped away from the paranoia as best I could. Uh, Nina Wugmeister has something of a follow-up. Did you speak with the professor emeritus who spotted you about that incident? <laughs> yeah, we had, we, had some, we had some good laughs about it. Uh, I mean, he, he, I mean, he was, he's, he's a great guy. Uh, another, I mean, another sort of bookend to that experience is at, uh, at UAlbany, I, I moved into the office of another professor who's become a professor emeritus. So she, so the professor, Judy Federley, uh, she left Albany, great professor. Uh, I wound up moving to her office. It had great windows, a view of the, the mountains, a little bit better than the office I was in. And so I would, I was, after work, I would always go to Judy's, essentially Judy's office and do my job. Uh, but one day I was working the, the document checking station. I was, by this time I was doing it by myself and who should walk up, but another professor emeritus, Judy Federley, there she is. And she presents her driver's license to me and her boarding pass. And I take it and I sort of wait for her to sort of say, Hey, Ed, what do you do to do a sort of Jean Garber and say, Ed, what are you doing here? nothing uh i do i make those little squiggly marks and and you know scan do the do the job i hand it back to her and she just keeps going uh so for me that was that was kind of wild that that uh that that in, in that environment i had become a tsa person and that i wasn't seen by this person whose office i occupied as as me i had my name tag on my chest you know, there aren't that many Schwarzschilds here in Albany, but, uh, but still, it was, it was a wild moment. Right. If you're used to seeing somebody in a different setting, it's just very difficult to, to pick someone up like that. You're not, yeah. That's really interesting. Um, I got to ask this question. This is from David Shapiro. This is the kind of question I really want to ask. <laughs> it says, hi, Ed. Congrats about the book. Can't wait to read it. I'm obsessed with the x-ray machine at the airport. What possessions reveal in disguise, in shapes and colors, about people? What's the craziest thing you saw that made you do a double take, if not removed from a bag? <laughs> hey, David, that's an awesome question. Uh, that's, a, that's a filmmaker's question for sure. Uh, David's a phenomenal filmmaker. Uh, well, let me say, first of all, that one thing I was impressed by working the, the, the sort of scanning or the, the x-ray machine on bag check was that there were people who worked that job who are incredibly good at it. You, you develop kind of an image repertoire in your mind. And these guys, they could, you know, I could see something. I have no idea what it was in those representations, those images. They're, they're flat. They're, the colors are weird. Uh, I could see things. Like, Is this a threat? Is it not a threat? It took a long time to be sure. Uh, some guys would look like three seconds. They'd be like, that's a car toy. Uh, that is, uh, those are hand warmers for a hunter, like any, anything. They just, they just yeah. knew immediately what it was. Uh, the weirdest thing I saw, I mean, it was, I saw one of these crazy wine shoes, like a high heeled shoe, it, but it, it, it scanned really weird because it was all metal. And uh, I didn't know, it looked like a weapon because it was so pointy. I didn't know what that was. Uh, it was, it, but again, one of my colleagues just said, or my, one of my coworkers said, 
that's a that's a wine shoe <laughs> but i didn't you know and then we saw we saw little knives and those things that you know are frustrating when people remove them i never saw a, a gun or anything like that but i was the wine shoe was one of the the most puzzling items i saw <laughs> I'm going to Google that one. I have no idea what that is. <laughs> it's a high heel shoe. It holds the, I guess you would put your bottle of wine in it, and then you could take the bottle of wine out of the wine shoe if that's something you wanted to do. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Interesting. Um, this is from Marissa Kutz. Uh, what was your experience working with your editor? How vital is the editor, considering you're an experienced creative writing prof, steering other writers? Uh, I love working with an editor. And, and the people at SUNY Press have been, have been great. They've been, they've been really responsive and, and they've been, they ask good questions and, and they, were, they, they helped me work through the final uh, addition to the manuscript in a really great way. I, I had worked on the book a long time before it got to them. So I'm, I'm, I don't think it needed as much work as maybe other books need, but, uh, but they were, it needed more work than I thought. <laughs> and they were, they were super helpful. Actually, can you talk a little bit about that process? Is there something that really it just took, like maybe whether it's an editor or just like a, a beta reader or a friend that's reading, is there something that someone pointed out to you and you go, oh, why didn't I think about that? Like there must be some revelations. So I even have them in nonfiction where it just, it just takes another set of eyes to go, you're right. I don't know why I didn't think about that. Did you have any of those moments? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are some of the characters, I mean, there's a character in the book named Hank, who's a who is complicated too in, in many ways. He's the he's the brother of the of, of Lori. And you know, he's got he's dealing with grief in his own way, but he is an FBI agent and he's got a much much more uh, experienced and, and uh, hard line attitude about security in, in in and how security industry work should be done. So he and Gary have a difficult relationship. And it, it took me a while to figure out how that relationship was gonna be resolved in the book. And uh, a good friend of mine uh, was able to sort of read it and help me understand Hank's psychology and, and help me understand the sort of brother-in-law uh, relationship in a way that I, I kept banging my head up against. And I, I, was, I was super grateful uh, to Ike for helping with that. Uh, this question comes from somebody I think you'll uh, recognize. Uh. <laughs> Hi. This is your family downstairs. We love you and are so proud of you. What's next for you creatively? <laughs> Hi, family. I love you and I'm proud of you. Uh, uh, I'm so glad you're you're listening in. You know, you hear you hear me talk plenty. Uh, this is like bonus time, uh, more dad talk. But uh, I'm, I'm I'm working on I'm working on a couple things. I'm working on a, a, another security project with a colleague. Uh, my, a photographer, Danny Goodwin, who's, who's a, a great colleague and a, and a fantastic photographer. And sort of growing out of this book, we've been interviewing people who work in the security realm uh, to try to get, get their story told, not just in the TSA, but in the DHS. And, and we're, we're putting together a documentary book about it uh, that's been in the, in the tradition of like Studs Terkel, just a, an oral history that captures uh, the lives of the men and women who are doing this work in a, in a nonfiction way, uh, to, to, but to do something similar to what the novel does, to kind of help people understand this expanding workforce. Uh, and I'm also working on a new novel that's set in, uh, you know, set partially in Germany during World War I. It's, it, I've been, that's, the, that's the next thing I've been sinking plenty of years into reading about uh, chemical warfare and, and physics and uh, and things like that connected to uh, Carl Schwarzschild, who has my name, and I've always been fascinated by him. And he was the one who figured out the Schwarzschild radius that gave us black holes and things like that. Oh, wow. So it's a very personal project, too. <laughs> it's personal. Well, I'm gonna ask, yeah. yeah, I was going to ask you one more personal question, because I think it's just relevant, because I think the relationship in insecurity between Gary and Ben is just, it's really beautiful. It's really it feels extraordinarily real and, and emotional. And I'm just wondering, you know, obviously Miller, a little bit older than that, but what, what can you take from your relationship as a father and, and bring it into the pages of a book like this? Are there, you know, clearly things that you've done differently? It's based on memory, but how do you, how do you um, work in a, a relationship like that into fiction? Yeah. I mean, why do I keep, why do I keep writing about fathers and sons? You know, that, that's a question I ask myself. And, 
it has to do with the desire to to be a, a good father. Like, how do I how do I learn how to be the best father I can be for my son? Uh, and in writing about Ben, uh, sure, I, I I drew on my experience with Miller and and my love for Miller and and how what what we've been through together and and as a family. Uh, but I also drew, I, I felt like, I mean, it's a novel, right? It's not, this is not a memoir. Uh, so it's not, Ben is not Miller and I'm not Gary. Uh, so I felt free to draw upon anything connected to father-son relationships, anything connected to childhood that, that needed to be a part of this book. And, and that, that included my own memories of being a child. It included watching my brothers grow up. It included anything, anything I've seen in a, in a park or, or anything I've thought about regarding, you know, what it means to have, have a son, a lot of, a lot of great books I've read about fathers and sons that, that too connects. I mean, you know, Miller is certainly Miller and and Elisa are, are, you know, deeply enmeshed in, in the fabric of this novel, but it's a novel and, and it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be right to sort of start drawing lines between Ben and Miller or Elisa right. and Lori or anything like that. Right, right. I, I guess one of, the, one of the questions I always like to ask people is like, what are you reading lately that's really inspiring you today? Like, what do you, what's on your book, you know, your night table? Yeah, I'm, I'm reading a lot of World War One history. It's driving, <laughs> it's driving at least a crazy, like I have books here, like in, in I mean, there's the poisonous cloud. There's like a, a higher form of killing, dew of death. I mean, all this stuff about chemical warfare. Uh, but uh, the novel that I've read recently that I loved was uh, Richard Powers, The Overstory. Uh, that, that book just, just you know, blew me away. And, and uh, I found that super inspiring. I, I loved reading the, the Patrick Melrose novels lately. Uh, I went on a, I loved reading the Elena Ferrante novels. I've just been on a kick of those. I don't, I don't see myself writing a multi-volume uh, project like that, but I, love, I loved reading them. They just, just super inspiring. Wow. Well, that's really great. Well, I think we will end it right there. We're coming up on uh, 830 right now. Um, I just want to thank everybody for coming out. It's a really good crowd, it looked like, and some great questions. And uh, I cannot really recommend this book strongly enough. Like I said, I read this in one sitting, and I read it right through. And it was, to me, it was uh, unputdownable, I would, I would say. And so I just uh, want to credit you for doing that, because that's not an easy thing to do these days, especially with all that's going on in the world, to rivet somebody that you can actually not stop reading a novel. So um, congratulations, Ed. This is a really great piece of work and I, I'm, I'm really honored to be doing this with you today. And I just wanna also thank Greenlight. I definitely go onto the Greenlight website, order the book. Um, you, you'll be like me, you won't wanna put it down. So thank you. Uh, Gil, thank you so much. I, 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 can't, I can't really express how grateful I am. And thanks to you, thanks to everybody at Greenlight. This has been uh, a really fun night in a, in a difficult time. So, so thanks everybody. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Edward and Gilbert, for tonight's wonderful conversation and for our little insider look into the TSA. Um, and thank you, everyone, for coming out and sharing this space with us tonight. A uh, reminder, again, that you can buy in security through greenlightbookstore.com, or if you're Brooklyn local, you can shop in store uh, Tuesday through Sunday, 12 p.m. to 6 p.m. Um, and also, uh, in case you missed any part of tonight's event or you just want to indulge in a rewatch or share with friends and family who missed it, tonight's event has been recorded. It'll be up on our YouTube channel, Greenlight Bookstore, within a couple of days, so keep an eye out for that. Thank you so much again, everyone, and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thanks, Chelsea. Take care. Thank you.